This week on Theater Talk. There's a light bulb. It's, it's, it's a real thing. That's it's, real it's, light bulb. it's still warm and yeah. the whole thing. Now, if I were to make this disappear, it'd be a good trick, right? Be, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't do that. What I do is. You know, I do this. <laughs> <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Coming up, we're celebrating the holidays with Todd Robbins, the star of Play Dead. But first, one of my favorite comedians is on Broadway now, and we are very happy he's here. Colin Quinn has a very funny show on Broadway now at the Helen Hayes. It is called Long Story Short. You know him, of course, from Saturday Night Live. And... Um, what was the wonderful comedian show that the you did for crowd. a while? The Tough Crowd. Tough Crowd, right. yeah. We miss the Tough Crowd. Tough Crowd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I miss it more than anybody. Believe me, I'm still fuming, like I was saying, about uh, it being off the air. Yeah, yeah. Well, they should bring that back. Colin Quinn, uh, congratulations on the success on Broadway, and welcome to Thanks. the Thanks. All right, Colin, before we jump into your show, I have to ask you, what is it like performing <laughs> on Broadway now when all anybody is writing about is Spider-Man? Do you guys feel you're getting the cold shoulder from everybody? Well, I mean, I deserve it, but how do you think Al Pacino feels right across the street? <laughs> <laughs> He's Al, the Merchant of Venice. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares, right? <laughs> now, you're, you're kind of a newcomer to Broadway. Are you following all this crazy gossip about Spider-Man that's flying around all yeah, the time? Yeah, of course I am. I'm loving every bit of it. <laughs> but, Colin, if Michael Riedel of the New York Post had come to your first preview, would you have considered that to be fair? Um... Yeah, well, now, of course, in retrospect, of course. <laughs> <laughs> now that you're a big success on Broadway, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but, it, uh, but that's the thing. Obviously, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. I mean, when was the first preview supposed to be? Like eight years ago? <laughs> but I resent, anyway, cartoons. You're talking to the wrong guy. Because I resent when Spider-Man was made into a movie. Yeah. I resented it. When I was a kid and I read the comic book, I didn't like the comic book as a kid. So I'm really not the biggest Why did you man. resent the movie? <laughs> I don't know. I don't like comics that much. Oh. They bother me. <laughs> you like comedians, but not comics. I like comedians, but I don't like comics. I don't like when comics... I like when they're in comic book form, but I don't like when people start making movies out of them. Yeah. Because it seems like... This happened like about when Batman started, I guess. But suddenly I'm watching this stuff going, oh, is this what it is now? The adults are watching cartoons and the kids are watching like gangster movies. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like it felt like all the adults are going to see these cartoons. It was making me fuming mad, so it still bugs me. <laughs> now, so now, I have no sympathy for Spider-Man. Now, uh, Spider-Man has a famous, famous control freak, really tough director, Julie Taymor. Uh, your director is Jerry Seinfeld. Is he a control oh, freak, my God. crazy? Uh, <laughs> you ever see him on too? Seinfeld? He's just that same way. <laughs> he's almost OCD. Everything's folded and everything's done the right thing. But you know, he's working. We work well together because I'm just the opposite. It's almost like the odd couple over here. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your approach to it? You just kind of come in and would do the show, but he wants to plot everything out? Well, he plots it out. I mean, you know, he helps me structure a lot of stuff and helps me mostly a lot of great you know, editing as far as, you know, I mean, I'll just ramble up there. If I'll stay up there for three hours if, if it's up to me, you know, mm -hmm. just keep talking about one, you know, the Morian Empire until everyone's like, shut up. <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, you know, so we work together. We work actually well together in that way, you know. Mm -hmm. What's the, um, if there is a, not, not to get too pretentious here, but is there a theme to uh, Colin Quinn? Sure there is. Sure. <laughs> the theme is, a proper is, Broadway show, right? which is perfect for Spider-Man, yeah. <laughs> continuing to do the same thing even after it stops working. <laughs> and how... No, I don't mean the show. I'm just saying <laughs> that if at some point she's like going to have to like, you know, I don't even know. I'm, just, But I'm saying like you have to lay back and go, okay, I keep pushing in the same direction. I got to lay back and yeah. see what's going on. And every empire, you know, the Greeks think, think, think. But then when thinking stops working, you still use it. And then the Romans, they kept building and kept expanding and that stopped working. But they kept doing it because it's all you, what got you successful. Right. Well, you also think that civilizations reach a stage where they, they, they become overserved and there's too many rich people getting everything they want. And, and, right. I, and I think we could look at Spider-Man where they could spend all the money they wanted to and it's sort of, uh, it, it, see, at this point we don't know. It we has, don't the, know. It has it, the opposite it, it, yeah, effect. Yeah. Like you can't, when you have no boundaries, when people go, hey, here's all the money you want, here's no boundaries, just do your thing, then it always ends up in that weird space, you know? How come you decided to do... Um, a show, I mean, a, a, a structured show as opposed to the kind of stand-up stuff that you've been doing for your, your whole career. Because you could have come like Jackie Mason and done the routine you've been doing. Uh, let me tell you this. Uh, Mr. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, because um, 
Because, I mean, well, because, I mean, I wanted to be thematic, you know, like, I like doing stand-up that's more thematic. Anyway, I just, I've done other shows, like the Irish Wake, and then I did this other show about the economy that I only ran for a few weeks because I had to, I got into this movie, I wanted to get, you know, do the movie, so, but I like thematic things now. I feel like stand-up, you know what I mean? Like, that's the way to do it now. Mm -hmm. We all do stand-up all the time, but nobody really notices stand-up because it's non-thematic, even though most stand-ups... I mean, Very well structured, secretly, right? That's, right, yeah. but I mean, but never the big picture because the audience has ADD and they're drunk and they're eating, you know, <laughs> mozzarella sticks and chicken wings, and the people are serving them. So you can't like keep them on one subject. So you have to keep changing subjects. But mm -hmm. all stand-ups I see, they all say things where I'm like, that is really deep. That's funny. Like a lot of stand-ups. Mm -hmm. And um, so I mean, I felt like, yeah, I wanted to try to feed into that. But you have to do it in a the theater. You can't just do it in a stand-up club because I'm interested about. Um stand-up and, and comedians and the, and the stuff. I, there was a show years ago that I loved called uh, Catskills on Broadway with Malzi Lawrence. I don't know. Brilliant comedian. Um, uh, Freddie Roman. Yeah, remember Freddie Roman? Dolls. Dick Capri. That's right. All these old Catskill guys. Yes. And I was, a young, I was young when I saw it. And, you know, I, 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 I was naive. I thought stand-up is like guys get up there and it's all extemporaneous and they're making jokes. But, right. but um, Malzi Lawrence told me that he wrote out the routine word by word and practiced it in the mirror. That he had it down, the, there was a balletic movement to the way he went around on stage to get the laugh. Do you, is that how a comedian really works? Or you? No, not that none of the ones I know work like that, but it's it's good to work that way, I guess. You know, I mean, it sounds like a good technique. But most of the guys I know, you come up with an idea, you know, like wiki le leaks to this week, right? And then you walk up there and you just like you have like three things that you think are funny, you'll get to, but you're trying to find a way to make it into something funny. You know, what's mm -hmm. funny about wiki leaks? What's funny about it? Yeah. Well, the fact that the kid, well, my take is that the guy, first of all, that he looks like, Julian Assange looks like Neil Patrick Harris. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, just the like human nature of people going, look, we'll tell them we're bombing them. Like Al Qaeda doesn't care that Yemen bombs them, just America. It's like the guy that wants his girlfriend when they break up, he, she can sleep with anybody except that one guy. Yes. Like Al Qaeda just can't stand the thought of being bombed by us. They don't care about being bombed. They're like, just not them, anybody but them, you know? And, like just all those little nuanced things and you know. Do you have the freedom within the uh, act on Broadway, uh, long story short, to play around a little bit if you want to, or is Seinfeld? Uh... Off the record, no, yeah, Jerry's, <laughs> me, we, we, me and him we were talking last week, we wanted to get up to something for Portugal and Ireland because of the whole economic crisis. So we're always trying to, you know what I mean? Right. But the producers have a kind of you, heart attack. You, you they, got any thoughts for Ireland? Oh yeah, of course, yeah. about the fact that yeah. they, were, they were, they only had money for six years. <laughs> And now they're broke again. <laughs> it's like MC Hammer, you know, everybody deserves some of this. <laughs> people are going over there left, and, uh, you know, they're just like, Jesus Christ. And, um, <laughs> no, it is kind of true. Ireland's reverted to back to what it always was. Poor potato eaters. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, who are the comedians that influenced you the most when you were growing up? The ones that influenced most people, uh, Richard Pryor, George Carlin. Right. For some reason, all of us. Were, Your generation of guys. My generation was totally... I mean, maybe, I don't know why, but I mean, I just remember listening to their albums like all the time and just being blown away by it. Mm -hmm. Like they were like a whole new vibe of comedy. How old were you when they were coming along? 12, 13. Oh, really? When so they were putting out their albums, yeah. Have you gone back to look like uh, to look at uh, comedians even before then? You know, Bob Hope, Jack Benny, George Burns, those, the real... Like on YouTube? Well, you know the comedian, no, nah, not that much. Mm -hmm. I should be, but the ones that we real, because a lot of them didn't do... Like they had jokes written for yeah, them. Like, I, like I, I just, I, it, was, it was a different style, but the guy that everybody loves in comedy to this day, no matter if they're young or old, is Don Rickles. Uh -huh. Every comedian loves Don Rickles. Yeah. Just because he's naturally, you know, just he's still got that still same personality. It. He's yeah. still funny, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Even though his act maybe a little, but he's just that yeah. guy. And know? did he write his own? Did we know and he Jackie wrote his own material? Yeah, I mean, he didn't, he wasn't even that, material wasn't even that amazing. It was just that. Attitude, you know. It's the delivery. Yeah, and just looking at, you know, reacting. Why, Johnny? <laughs> and uh, you, you were the war you did the news on Saturday Night Live for a right, while. Right, was, right. Did that mean you were the warm up guy uh, for the? Yeah, yeah, audience? I did the warm up too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, was was that a good experience for you, or did that become uh, uh, too overwhelming? Um, were you there snorting coke and freaking no, out? Like no, 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 none of that. But I mean, it was, it was, it's definitely. It's a, it's a very contained style compared to the way I like to work comedically. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it really is set up in joke punchline. Yes. Yeah. In a suit and a tie, and it's kind of hard for Plus, me. now I notice they're always reading the cue cards. And you think, I know it's live, people, but can't you remember a couple of lines? Yes. You, you know? But they do change them a lot at the last minute. Yeah, oh, they do. I'm All only right. defending them because I read the cue cards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't tell. 
We I was like, so anyway. <laughs> What's <laughs> it's nerve wracking. <laughs> What's the um... some people are very good at that. They're like Will Ferrell. They sit there and read their yes. lines yeah. all the time and just memorize them. Yeah. Or like, yeah, what are you a professional or something? <laughs> <laughs> What's the sort of um, <laughs> the the shelf life of a Saturday Night Live cast? Really? When do you guys realize uh, we're gonna be? Usually, I think like five years. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And why is that? What happens? I don't know, but right now there's some people that have been there like seven years, but they'll be leaving soon enough. But yeah. I mean, but they're all like, this cast has a lot of funny, just when you think it's over. That's the thing about SNL when you're like, ah, this is gonna stink. Then these people come along like, what's the face, Kristen Wiig, and this other guy, you ever see him, uh, I can't remember his name, but he does the club kid, oh, and yeah. it's yeah. really yeah. so funny. And yeah. just when you think things are over, but it's five years. I mean, in fact, but, five years is a lot. Chevy Chase was on for one year. Yes, that's, that's right. right. That's, that's right. right. But right. they didn't. Even, but they used to do it with a much smaller cast, and that seemed I mean, yeah, I think they more interesting. Bigger, I think they yeah. spread it out too what much. What is it, yeah. What is a Saturday Night Live audition like when you were going up to get? Well, on the show? I auditioned as a writer, mm -hmm. and sort of a, a half a cast idea. But I went as I did stand up, and it was the worst set. I mean, I've had a lot of bomb sets in my life. <laughs> I'm proud of it, but this one was worse than anything I've ever had. They brought in a bunch of 15-year-old kids from a camp. <laughs> like they were having, like stand-up was really in dire straits at the time, so they had to bring in a camp. But they were 15-year-old <laughs> kids that were in summer camp. It was in the summer. And the whole audience is 15-year-old kids. <laughs> and Lorne Michaels. And Lorne Michaels and his people. 15-year-olds. So, I mean, I just could not have done worse. But you got the job. But I you got the job as a writer. Oh. And then so, Lorne so told me a couple of years later, yeah, you were... You know, you extended a couple of people's careers with that set that, you know, you kept a couple of people in the game with that horrible set. <laughs> yeah. that people that I wouldn't have normally thought of keeping, but you were just so <laughs> so, so before we wrap up, you know, you're, you're, you're tracing the trajectory of Western civilization on, on stage at, at, at the show. Hell of sure every weekend. And Not just Western civilization. All, yes. All of them. All civilization. Mm -hmm. you, you have any, you have any, any, any tips? Uh, I was never tips? so politically correct in my life. <laughs> Yeah, do you have any tips how we can save ourselves? We seem to be about going off the rails here. Yeah, no, there's no tips. There's no, there's no salvation. <laughs> there's no, uh, yeah, there's no way out. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, but that's the beauty of it is that, you know, that it, because everybody keeps doing this, you feel like, well, it's never really going to end. You know what I mean? Like, everyone's kind of feels that semi-apocalyptic feel all the time now. Yeah. Because we are so close and there's so many... But really, I mean, even the WikiLeaks, to bring that back, not that I, I don't like the term WikiLeaks, it's a little annoying. <laughs> it's Swedish. <laughs> it sounds kind of mamby pamby, I gotta say. It does, for, it for, sounds for the havoc it's wreaking. Yes. WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks. It sounds like a kid's toy. It does. Well, that's the Swedish IKEA kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but he's from Australia, the guy, but he lives in Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. And now he's hiding in Switzerland. <laughs> but I mean, but that's the kind of thing where it's like even that, you're looking around, you realize it's just humanity, all this high tech stuff. And people are just bad mouthing. Everybody just does their thing. Like no, humanity never changes since yeah. day one. And I guess the worse it gets, the better the material is for the comedian. I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> the show, the show, very very funny show with a serious theme floating yeah. through there, is uh, called Colin Quinn. Long story short, it's at the. Helen Hayes Theater till January 9th, but uh, talk about an extension perhaps? or uh... Well, either an extension or I'll be uh, replacing Peter Parker in the. <laughs> <laughs> Colin Quinn, it's been a great pleasure. Thanks for being here. <laughs> the British Empire at its peak controlled one fourth of the, of the land mass and population in the world. This, by the way, is a little country. They just, so they didn't do it with military might, they had something far more powerful. Contempt. <laughs> they tap into people's insecurities and their low self-esteem. They would show up with polished swords, pressed uniforms. Really? This is where you live? <laughs> uh, at Spider-Man, Susan, they have spent $65 million to try to come up with special effects that don't work. But at the Players Theater on McDougal Street, you will find the best special effects in town at a fraction of the cost. The show is called Play Dead. It was put together by Todd Robbins and Teller of Penn & Teller fame. Todd is the star of the show, and he is with us today on Theater Talk. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. It's and congratulations on, this is kind of a creepy Christmas show, right? Well, yeah, it, it's, it's sort of a, you've, you've heard of Nightmare before, uh, uh, 
Christmas that this is sort of and and it's appropriate for Christmas because you know <laughs> when it comes to terror there is no greater horror than having to face your family at this time of year so uh, as we like to say we uh, we'll, we'll scare the dickens out of you it's appropriate <laughs> there, so. absolutely all right now Todd for people who haven't seen the show just give us a sense of what you're doing in play dead it, it's uh, it's a very deceptive show in that I tell ghost stories but it's about real people and everything though it seems like it's fiction everything I tell you is real Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you get a sense as I'm telling these stories about these various people some good some not so good that they're gone but they're not far away Mm -hmm. and they kind of make their presence known and then towards the end of the show it's very possible they'll come back for a visit and if the dead were to return, why do you think it would be pleasant? And we should say this is interactive because uh, you are, if you're sitting in the audience, yeah. you are going to be part of the show in some it, way. It's, it's, yes, it, uh, there is no fourth wall. Uh, you are basically are locked in the theater with me. and uh, It's that, scary. Yeah. It, it's <laughs> scary. Well, I will let you say that because, you know, the fact is uh, there are shows that go, oh, it's going to scare you. And people go, oh, yeah? Oh, yeah, it's going to scare me? Okay, fine. Come on, bring your scare on. So we just say that there's, you know, a little... A little tinge of terror and... and I have a friend who took his 80-year-old grandmother, and she was very scared. Don't take your 80-year-old grandmother. (laughs) (laughs) Unless unless you want her to become part of the permanent company. (laughs) (laughs) Have you had any incidents with audience members, maybe kids who come who are really terrified out of your wits and you have to calm them down? We start off the show and kind of let people know what they're in for. And we're very... There's... There's an advisory out in the uh, the lobby that says if you are afraid of the dark, if you are claustrophobic, if you've recently <laughs> had uh, lost someone, if you're bereaved, right. this might not be the, the show for you. Because you communicate with the yeah. dead in this yeah. show. Yeah, there, there's, we, there are many levels of playing with the, the concept of death in there, from just being kind of spooky entertainment to really talking about the, the real evil of, of people talking to the dead and, and feeding on other people's pain. Mm-hmm. So um, we've had a number of people that... After uh, the opening, what we call the opening dark room, where we throw everyone in darkness for a while and just let them do whatever they want well, to do. Well, you should say, you yeah. know, if you want to leave, leave now. Yeah. And then and once they don't leave, you lock, lock the door. Yeah, you lock yeah, the yeah exactly. And, and they, have, they have no choice. They're on the ride. So, I mean, the, the basic concept is, and I know you're a historian of all these wonderful yeah. tricks and suspense mm-hmm. things, which we'll talk about in a minute, but essentially the concept is... It's a fun house, right? You've it created is. a fun house in the theater. It is. It's, it's a uh, sort of a, a wonderful gumbo of a number of different forms, uh, from seances mm-hmm. to the midnight spook shows, which were these, yeah, yeah. these fun magic shows, dark magic shows that were done uh, late at night in movie theaters. And they would do an hour-long show, that, that the climax of which was the lights would go out and, and the ghosts would come forth. And they were over the top and they were cheesy and often done by alcoholics, that, magicians <laughs> that would fall into the orchestra pit in the dark and you know, fun things. <laughs> like that and then they show a really bad movie thereafter a really cheesy uh, movie but uh, and there was often a gorilla or a Frankenstein monster that would be made to appear and come at the audience and it was really for teenagers to uh, clench each other in the dark I mean that was the whole purpose of it and they always advertised oh we're gonna have monsters and ghost hands will reach out and grab you and they never had to really do that because the audience members would do it to each other so we (laughs) we sort of set that tone at the beginning of the show that's right and really what a lot of people miss about the show is that it's very autobiographical it it sort of follows my progression in my relationship with death Mm -hmm. in that when as I was a kid I used to throw parties in a a local cemetery at night Mm -hmm. and just spook people with with ghost stories and just fill their imagination let them do everything else and it's amazing what they would do. And, um, and then, Can you give us an example? Well, it, like I say in the show, it, the, the groans I heard coming for the graves were not the groans of the dead. Let's put it that way. It was, uh, uh, now, i got to ask you, though, where sure. did this fascination with, uh, with death and the creepy side of well, life I, I grew from? up in Southern California. What more do you need to know? Uh, Sunny all the time, enough it, of this. Exactly. And there, there was just you know, a fascination growing up in the suburbs of Southern California of just wanting a little something more. And I got into magic. And everyone that's involved with magic for any period of time wants to do a seance. And that uh, same thing for me. Uh, I just loved it because it's a whole different side of deception. Right. There's one thing, you do a card trick and it's all pleasant, and everything's fine, and everyone lives happily ever after. Then there are people who do seances, which they're deceiving you, but they're telling you it's real. Right. And it's a whole different layer of, of deception and, right. and interaction with an audience. What, what, sorry. What I find fascinating about what you do and, and the whole notion of the seance is that you creep people out also psychologically. Mm-hmm. You know, you are manipulating people's emotions in a way. Is that 
part oh. of the, the, the trick of a magician? Oh, it's very much so. It's very much so because, uh, you, you, well, you know, the, the thing about it is uh, when we were putting the show together, and I, I, the earliest version of this was in the New York International Fringe Festival about five years ago, and uh, it was a straight-ahead seance, kind of recreation of Victorian seance. But I was very honest with the audience. I said, it's always been fake. It always will be fake. Tonight will be no different. Right. You play the role of the believer. I'll play the role of the medium. And we'll have some fun here. But you have to really look at it and suspend disbelief. O for a muse of fire is basically what I was saying. Mm -hmm. So it is a form of theater here that we're doing in that when people are creeped out, if they really knew what was creeping them out, they wouldn't be creeped out. It is their own imagination. Mm -hmm. It is that suspension of disbelief that they really feel they're in harm's way mm -hmm. when, we, when we go for the terror and the, and the horror and the show. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's, it's an, just another level of, of deception that is just really, really fun. Yeah. Um, there, I, I know you probably use some modern things, but a lot of the tricks you use are the old-fashioned tricks that have always been used, right? Yeah, there's uh, a combination of cutting-edge technology, which m magic has used uh, quite often, mm -hmm. that uh, if you stay a little ahead of the curve of what people are aware of, you can do, you can affect miracles with this stuff. And uh, then there's some really old, ancient, ancient, ancient uh, techniques. Yeah. We, there's there's uh, quite a bit of smoke and quite a bit of mirrors. In the, uh, <laughs> and things the, floating yeah, and around. Things floating around yeah. Can we, you show us any tricks? Well, you know what the, the the best trick yes. in the whole thing is something that uh, it's what you sort of were saying about the um, uh, the uh, using people's imagination and what people know and don't know. And uh, there's something I do at the beginning, which is a sideshow thing. It's really the only sideshow thing in there, and it's really the only real trick mm -hmm. in it, which is uh, well, just uh, select one of the light bulbs, uh, Susan, if you would, and, and unscrew one of them. It can be any of them. I don't care. All right. Well, here's a light bulb. Okay. All right. Good. Just, yeah, just unscrew that if you would. Is that real? That's a here's a, here's yeah, these here's are, the light bulb. These are yeah. real light bulbs. Okay. Yeah. We right. went to Dwayne Reed this morning, I think, and <laughs> <laughs> got, got these. Go. Yeah. All right. So here's a light bulb. And it's, it's, it's a real thing. That's it's, real it's, light it's still warm yes. and the whole thing. Now, if I were to make this disappear, it'd be a good trick, right? Be, yeah. 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 I don't do that. What I do is, you know, I do this. <laughs> 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 this is actually happening, yeah. folks. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> it, it, uh, it, 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 I, uh, I'm doing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I need that part, but I got to fly to Chicago. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so, the thing about it is, I do this in the show eating glass because people think it's got to be fake, but it's real. You know, and it also, this is really, really, it, it, it kind of symbolizes <laughs> that we're going into darkness. I'm kind of consuming the light. And at the end of the show, the ghost light is restored and we do a little magic with that. <laughs> uh, now, is it true? I was told. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I shouldn't. I, I shouldn't what, attempt what, what, this. Michael? I shouldn't attempt this no, myself. There's, there's a way of chewing it up and swallowing it so it doesn't cut up in my mouth and throat. I learned it from an old side guy who did it for 35 years. So, he taught me the technique. I've eaten more than 4,000 light bulbs during the course of my career. So you made Guinness Book of Records. Uh, yeah, right? yeah. And light bulb I'm, I'm, <laughs> you, you clean your plate. I know, too. I know. Actually, you don't clean the plate. You can eat the plate. Well, there are children starving in New Jersey. So um, <laughs> um, uh, now I was told that out in Vegas, one of your investors said. Is that a, is that light bulb? Is that really glass that you were eating there? No, it, it, it challenged was, you. And didn't you pick it take the wine even, glass and you ate the wine glass? Yeah, it wasn't even that. It was it was like she. Um, we were talking about what we we're going to do for publicity. Yeah. And our publicist uh, said, "Well, we can have you eat the light bulb." And this one producer said, "Oh no, we can't have her do that because that's not real." Now she had been around the show for <laughs> months and months and months and had seen me do this dozens and dozens of times. And I said, "Well, what?" And she said, "No, you." That seems not real. <laughs> um, so I reached over across the table and picked up her wine glass and bit into it and set it down. I said, so now what do you think? So I should believe her thereafter. Don't eat the theater talk mug. That's really expensive, please. Yeah. It might be a little heavy. However, if you know, if you um, if you support theater talk, I'm you know. I'll eat a mug for uh, you. No, before we go, I want to say you in in Play Dead. Mm -hmm. There's also audience participation. Oh, is there ever? Oh yes. You you, you bring, really get you, you bring people, apart. Yes, you mm -hmm. bring people out of the audience, and uh, here's here's one of the people that you brought up out of the audience. Yes, yeah, so a familiar mug shot here. Uh, this is um, shortly after I, I birthed a um, 
dead girl out, out of, of um, uh, the, 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 the ripped open stomach of Michael Riedel. Well, yeah. and you, you said you pulled the evil out of him. Yeah, as much as I could. It's only a, a 90 minute show. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> not enough. Yeah, not, not enough. enough. I'm no, still please. on a tear yeah, about no. Spider Man. Right. Actually, this is, um, this is what I look like. If I ever went backstage to Spider-Man, I think this is what <laughs> yeah. uh, And we should say, folks, if you get pulled up in the audience, that is washable blood, yeah. it comes out, and all that. All so. right. But Great. the experience will last uh, a lifetime. There you go. Uh, listen, Todd, please help yourself to oh, thank any you. more light bulbs. Some buffet here. <laughs> Catered shoot. Craft Services did a lovely job here. The show is called Play Dead. It is, uh, without any question, the most enjoyable show running in New York. Now it's at the Players Theater on McDougal. Creepy, scary, and it stars Todd Robbins. Todd, thanks a lot for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Talk. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank <laughs> you. As I say, eat up. There you go. Tempting. <laughs> you can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can Twitter us. And of course, the Jews never changed since time began. They're the same as in the Old Testament. They argue with their relatives every chapter of the Old Testament. They, then they argue with God. They always think they know the best way to do everything. Right? <laughs> they get turned into pillars of salt which is a Jew's worst nightmare because of the sodium. On triglycerides. <laughs> and uh, everywhere the Jews go, they got chased out immediately. That's why shalom means hello and goodbye. <laughs> and peace. And peace, because that's their story. We're here. We're leaving. Don't hit us. Shalom. Shalom. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>